Bom dia a todos. Good morning to you all. Let's just uh, wait one more minute, please. Bem, não, bom dia, temos, já temos a doutora Catarina Nunes. Um, bom dia a todos. Uh, good morning to you all. I'll, I'll have to speak both in Portuguese and English. Uh, antes antes de, de iniciarmos a, a sessão de abertura, isto, este vai ser um webinar sobre as oportunidades do mercado britânico de defesa. Eu queria, queria começar por agradecer a, a todos os participantes e aos oradores em, em em especial, um, portanto, vamos começar com o Dr. Pedro Patrício, que irá falar, dar uma perspectiva portuguesa sobre quem está em Londres, sobre como fazer negócios no mercado britânico, uh, e a seguir continuaremos com os nossos parceiros na organização destes webinars, a uh, uh, Space Defense Security and Space, uh, e com a um, UK DSA, que é a Defense and Security Export. Um, So I was telling the, the audience that uh, what was what was the program. Thank you very much for our British uh, distinguished guests. Uh, so let's start. And I will pass the palavra to the Catarina Nunes para iniciar a abertura. Muito bom dia, muito bom dia a todos. Muito obrigada. Good morning, everyone. Um, este é o primeiro webinar de dois, onde se pretende facilitar o encontro entre as empresas portuguesas e as britânicas no âmbito da economia de defesa. A IDD tem por missão ver uh, a cooperação e, e, e possibilitar as oportunidades de negócio entre as empresas de ambos os países. Queria aqui agradecer e reiterar o agradecimento do professor Ricardo Pinheiro Alves à ADS Group, que é a nossa parceira nesta organização e destes eventos em concreto. E também queria agradecer o apoio da UK Defense and Security Exports e naturalmente da ICEP. Um, aproveito desde já para anunciar que o Industry Day de Portugal Reino Unido será uh, na primeira semana de maio uh, em Lisboa, se a pandemia efetivamente man mantiver-se uh, controlada como, como assim esperamos e que em julho a IDD estará Uh, com um stand um, na Feira Internacional de Farnborough, dando continuidade a esta cooperação uh, das relações empresariais entre ambos os países. É muito mais do que qualquer outra, outra palavra que eu possa dizer, o importante é efetivamente percebermos como podemos, uh, podemos uh, cooperar, entre, entre as, uh, cooperar as empresas de ambos os países neste âmbito da economia de defesa. Portanto, muito bom trabalho e muito obrigada por estarem aqui. 
Muito obrigado. So now I'll pass to uh, Mr. Brinley Salzman, which is Director Overseas and Exports of the Aerospace Defense Security and Space. Thank you, Brinley. I'm sorry because we are mixing Portuguese with uh, with uh, English, but now it's it's your turn to to introduce the ADS and these and these webinars. Don't worry about it. Uh, hopefully, uh, people can see my slides. Yes, um, yes, we can see. Bon dia uh, to uh, the audience. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar. And uh, also, we're delighted to be working with our colleagues at IDD, um, Portugal Defence, on this exciting uh, uh, initiative. Hopefully, this webinar would, uh, and also parallel one, which we're having next week, will result in a, a holding of a successful um, uh, a conference in Lisbon in, in May, hopefully in the week of the uh, 9th of May, and further discussions of the Farm International Air Show. Uh, my uh, name is Brittany Sussman. I'm the Director of Overseas and Exports at ADS, and I'd like to give you a very brief, short uh, synopsis of ADS, what we are and how we can help Portuguese companies to identify UK uh, entities who they, with whom they can do business. Uh, ADS uh, is a not-for-profit making trade association, uh, representing about uh, 1,100 British companies involved in the civil aviation, defence, space and security sectors. And basically, our fundamental role is to try to assist our member companies to do business, both domestically and internationally. We've got a whole host of uh, uh, products and services which we offer to our companies to help them. And also, a whole uh, subsidiary of uh, ADS is Farm International Limited, which organises the Farm International Air Show every, every two years. Uh, in terms of size of uh, the UK industries, and this is not just on the defence side, but also civil aviation, uh, security and space. We're number one in, in Europe and second only behind the United States globally. And we generate about 30 billion pounds worth of uh, benefit to the UK economy and we support about a million jobs uh, based here in the UK. And we export about 20, over 20 billion pounds worth of goods and services uh, every year. Uh, and we reinvest uh, uh, about three billion pounds worth uh, of of, uh, of uh, uh, resources into research and development on an annual basis, and we're in the forefront of trying to make sure that we are uh, we assist the British government to uh, try to deliver a sustainable uh, Britain, uh, uh, which is the, the main uh, main strategic aim that they've got. In terms of the defence industry, uh, our defence industry represents about five percent of manufa manufacturing undertaken here in the UK. Uh, and in 2018, we won export orders with about 14 billion. In 2019, I think it was about 11 billion, and uh, in 2020, I think it was about 7.9 billion pounds. Uh, and uh, we represent a, a considerable um, uh, proportion of the global export market pace. And for every job created in the defence sector, it creates about 1.9 jobs elsewhere in the UK economy. In terms of the security side, uh, the UK share of the global security market in 2019 was worth about 8.1 billion pounds. In 2020, it was about 7.95 billion, I believe. Uh, and, the, and certainly with the help and assistance of UK uh, defence and security exports at the Department for International Trade, it's, uh, the security sector has grown exponentially in terms of its uh, ability to access uh, export markets. Also, in terms of the space sector, uh, this is an example of strategic investment by the government some years ago they identified the fact that uh, by investing uh, pump priming funding into the into the space sector it could help to develop a, a burgeoning uh, uh, space industry here in the uk and that is uh, that has been achieved certainly by uh, 2030 it's meant to uh, come up to about 40 billion pounds worth of turnover uh, in the year uh, every, every year um in terms of uh, Export uh, export uh, competitors. Uh, this shows the graph, which is based on the UK government's own figures, how we compare to other major exporters. With the US clearly a uh, number one spot, uh, but uh, us fighting for the number two spot uh, with with, with uh, also uh, Russia, France, uh, and China, and Italy. Uh, but we, we've got a, a strong stand in the international uh, environment. In terms of exports uh, by region, this shows uh, this shows the, the shares of the of the international marketplace with the U.S. again dominating uh, the marketplace. But us again uh, fighting for uh, the number two spot between uh, behind Russia uh, with Russia and, and France, uh, and with other countries also competing for that. Uh, in terms of events, we organise about 100, 170 to 190 events a, a year in a normal year. Of course, ever since March 2020, that's been uh, had to be uh, delivered more events on online and online format. They're a mix of exhibitions, 
missions, uh, conferences, webinars, and briefings, and so on, uh, which uh, take place. In terms of exhibitions which you get involved with, we, uh, the ones in bold are the ones which we get in, uh, we get organized UK national pavilions at. So, for instance, uh, the Farm International Air Show this July, we'll be having the UK national pavilion at. Also, we've got organized stands at IDEX, Dubai Air Show, the World Defense Show in, in, in um, uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, just coming up uh, uh, very shortly, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, places around the world. Uh, this is just a snapshot of just some of the main exhibitions which we get involved with. My role in uh, fundamental role is to try to help any of our member companies have any queries of any kind about overseas business and doing uh, overseas business. And therefore, I have close ties with a number of uh, government departments which are relevant for that cause. And I look, look after and look after an, a number of special interest groups uh, p looking at particular aspects of business ethics, uh, bribing corruption, human rights, and things like that. Also, export controls, market intelligence, often in, in, in industrial participation and counter trade, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, fundamentally, there's an, an essential need for any company who wants to do business internationally to identify potential partners in that country. Uh, with whom they can do business, joint venture partners. Um, there's very few countries around the world who want to be seen to be markets, they want to be seen to be um, partners. So therefore, when we put on events, uh, we don't uh, put them on and brand them as being uh, doing business in uh, Portugal, in Malaysia, it's doing business with Portugal, with Malaysia, with Australia. The fundamental role is to, of those is to facilitate networking uh, between our companies and the companies from those countries to uh, identify potential opportunities for joint financial partnerships to, uh, to, to take place. And to support that, we've uh, got in place a number of memorandum of understanding with sister trade associations in other countries, and we're in discussions with IDD Portugal Defence about uh, the opportunities to create one with with, uh, with them, uh, to facilitate um, ties up between uh, British companies and and uh, uh, and Portuguese companies. And uh, so. This, these are my contact details. I'm always happy to uh, take any queries of any kind from uh, from companies to try to assist them to identify how how we can try to do business together. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Brinley, for your very quick presentation. And I think uh, we will now proceed. And I'm sorry, but we will proceed now in Portuguese. So, uh, uh, vou apresentar agora o Dr. Pedro Patrício da ICEP Londres, a quem agradeço também a disponibilidade. Um, o Dr. Pedro Patrício é diretor para o Reino Unido e Conselheiro Comercial e Económico da Embaixada Portuguesa, além de, além de pertencer à ICEP, uh, e, e, e é um residente uh, no Reino Unido e, portanto, vai-nos dar uma perspectiva uh, portuguesa sobre o mercado, o mercado britânico. Dr. Pedro Patrício, faça a favor. Não estamos a ouvir. Mas conseguem ver o ecrã? Sim, sim, mas conseguimos ver o ecrã. Muito bom dia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, é um prazer estar aqui hoje convosco. Começo por agradecer ao IDD o amável convite e à ADS Group. Um, a minha apresentação vou falar, sobretudo, sobre, de uma forma mais generalizada sobre o mercado do Reino Unido. Aqui foi dita a minha perspectiva, tanto a viver cá. Dar algum, falar um pouco sobre algumas tendências e, eventualmente, algumas orientações como, como abordar o mercado. Deixarei, naturalmente, para os especialistas que falam a seguir a mim as oportunidades mais concretas no setor da defesa. Para, para, para falar sobre o Reino Unido, temos claramente que referir a importância económica do país. Trata-se de, de uma das economias mais prósperas do mundo, a quinta a nível mundial e a segunda a nível europeu. Só atrás da Alemanha. O PIB britânico, apesar de ter encolhido 9,4% no pior ano da pandemia, já recuperou 7,5% em uh, 2021 e prevê-se que cresça 5% em 2022. No pós-Brexit, o Reino Unido pretende reafirmar o seu posicionamento enquanto potência económica, o que se confirmando pelo aumento da despesa pública e alguns programas governamentais, de captação de investimento e posicionamento da oferta britânica, como é a campanha, a campanha Britain is Great, como muitos de vós saberão. O Reino Unido é o quinto maior importador de bens do mundo e o sexto de serviços. E apesar da balança comercial de serviços registar um superávit, a balança comercial de bens apresenta um déficit. 
que adicionando ao elevado poder de compra de cerca de 67 milhões de consumidores e uma, uma capacidade impar de financiamento por parte das empresas permite-nos confirmar a, atrita, a, a atratividade deste mercado. O Reino Unido, para o seu melhor desempenho económico, depende das importações, pois, e naturalmente, essas importações já têm cadeias de abastecimento que estão configuradas de forma a suprir o que não podem produzir internamente. Relativamente às valências tecnológicas e recursos qualificados, o Reino Unido goza de uma reputação de ser um centro global de excelência para o design e fabrico de máquinas e produtos elétricos de tecnologia avançada. São exemplos disso o fabrico de motores e helicópteros, asas, estruturas e sistemas de aeronaves, entre outros. O quarto lugar no Global Innovation Index confirma também essa reputação como polo mundial de inovação. O país beneficia também de recursos humanos altamente qualificados e uma grande capacidade de atrair talento que alimenta as suas características inovadoras. Vamos ver se as restrições que o Brexit impôs à importação ajudam o Reino Unido ou permitem ao Reino Unido conseguir atrair esses, aquilo que se chama de brains, os recursos altamente qualificados. Apesar do, do, do Brexit, o Reino Unido continua a ser dos países do mundo com mais, que mais atrai investimento direto estrangeiro, bem como aquilo que mais investe através das venture capitals. A soma destes recursos tecnológicos e humanos que referi, com a disponibilidade de financiamento existente no mercado britânico, é a receita para um excelente ambiente de desenvolvimento de negócios. Mas não se trata somente de investimento privado. O Estado também tem benefícios fiscais e incentivos às despesas associadas à investigação e desenvolvimento. É o oitavo maior investidor do mundo nesta categoria, como o uh, orador antes de mim teve a oportunidade de referir. No princípio deste mês, o governo britânico anunciou que ia investir 1.4 mil milhões de libras ao longo dos próximos 10 anos em tecnologias de defesa do espaço. Em 2016, já tinha anunciado também 800 milhões de libras num programa de aceleração chamado The Hans Innovation Initiative. Adaptação às novas regras comerciais. Apesar do acordo de comércio e cooperação celebrado entre o Reino Unido e a União Europeia, as trocas, as trocas comerciais passaram a estar sujeitas a procedimentos aduaneiros, não a taxas alfandegárias, mas a procedimentos aduaneiros burocráticos e fronteiriços que antes não existiam. A experiência das empresas portuguesas, aquelas empresas portuguesas que já exportam para mercados terceiros, poder-se-á provar importantíssima para esta nova adaptação. Ou seja, não há entraves diferentes às exportações para o Reino Unido do que para um país terceiro. E embora o Brexit tenha naturalmente afetado a relação comercial entre os nossos dois países, Portugal tem conseguido posicionar-se bem enquanto fornecedor britânico. As empresas têm conseguido manter e algumas até expandir as suas atividades e os seus negócios por este mercado. Para além disso, as nossas associações, neste caso temos aqui claramente um exemplo, as associações portuguesas continuam determinadas em explorar as oportunidades comerciais que o Reino Unido oferece. A título de exemplo, as exportações de Portugal para o Reino Unido de veículos aéreos com propulsão a motor, por exemplo, helicópteros e aviões e veículos espaciais, cresceram 24,5% de 2020 para 2021, ano que já estavam em vigor os novos trâmites do, do acordo comercial com a União Europeia. Relativamente à forma de concorrência, aqui há algo que claramente as empresas portuguesas têm que ter em, em conta. Existem oportunidades, existem claramente oportunidades para as empresas portuguesas abordarem o mercado, mas existe também uma concorrência fortíssima. E não são só de outras empresas portuguesas, como também dos nossos parceiros da União Europeia e os, de todo o mundo, as empresas de todo o mundo que querem e tentam fazer negócio com o mercado britânico. Isso não significa que uma empresa portuguesa interessada em abordar o mercado britânico terá necessariamente, significa que a empresa terá necessariamente que ter uma mais-valia ou no seu serviço ou no seu produto para conseguir concorrer com as restantes 
empresas a nível mundial. As empresas aqui presentes que assistem a este webinar saberão melhor do que ninguém o quão difícil é trabalhar, nós na ICEP somos multissetoriais, mas as empresas aqui saberão o quão difícil é trabalhar no setor da defesa. Passando, tendo pouco tempo da minha apresentação, passando muito rapidamente para os problemas logísticos, estou claramente à vossa disposição para responder as perguntas que tenham no, no final da, da apresentação. O, pelo seu posicionamento geográfico, os agentes económicos britânicos uh, a, e, e quem negocia com eles estão sujeitos a certos desafios, nomeadamente aos logísticos. E exemplos disso foram o, o disparado dos preços dos transportes marítimos e rodoviários, provocando não só, provocado não só pela pandemia, mas também pela escassez de mão de obra, o aumento do preço do petróleo e a adaptação a novos sistemas portuários e de desalfandegamento. Aqui há de referir que tem sido um processo bastante moroso para as autoridades britânicas. É importante que as empresas portuguesas estejam ao corrente de, destes riscos e desafios, forma a poderem acalculá-las, na medida do possível. Oferta diferenciada, como referi, sendo o mercado do Reino Unido bastante exigente e maduro, requer que potenciais fornecedores apresentem produtos inovadores, com a tal clara mais-valia que referi, e que se integrem nas supply chains existentes, complementando e melhorando as necessidades do mercado. Para isso, as deslocações ao mercado são fundamentais, não basta uma vez, certamente, mas várias deslocações ao mercado para fazer os negócios. Os eventos e feiras, alguns já aqui referidos pelo meu uh, orador antecessor, os eventos e feiras são possivelmente das melhores oportunidades para as empresas portuguesas conseguirem chegar aos decision makers e aos seus potenciais clientes e parceiros. As feiras de Farnborough e da DSEI são as principais do setor da defesa. Para além da presença, diríamos que assídua em feiras, as viagens de prospeção ao país são necessárias para os efeitos de networking e, idealmente, para o estabelecimento de parcerias. Ou seja, não basta ter um serviço com uma mais-valia, um produto com uma mais-valia, é preciso também dar-se a conhecer e, no dar-se a conhecer, é preciso conseguir chegar ao decision maker, o que, por suas vezes, poderá não ser tão fácil como, como, como esperaríamos, mas é preciso insistir e consegue. O decision maker pode ser um OAM, pode ser um first tier, second tier, third tier, e por aí afora. As grandes empresas do, do setor, como por exemplo a VAS Systems e a Rolls Royce, possuem nos seus sites os chamados supplier portals, que muitos de vós conhecerão. Contém toda a informação específica para que potenciais fornecedores possam vir a trabalhar com as mesmas. No entanto, a inscrição, como bem sabem, a inscrição nestes portais não garante que a empresa passe a trabalhar com, 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 com a empresa britânica. Uh, no, entanto, no entanto, a inscrição é importante, porque muitas vezes em conversa fazem sempre referência se estão ou não estão inscritos. E também nos vos permite, também permite a algumas empresas portuguesas perceber se estão ou não uh, capazes, se estão ou não, uh, se preenchem os requisitos necessários para poderem trabalhar com essas empresas britânicas. Para além destes supplier portals que referi, poderá também interessar verificar os diversos canais de procurement do próprio governo britânico, nomeadamente do Ministério da Defesa, que gasta em média 835 milhões de libras com as PMEs britânicas, bem como outros agregadores, como é o Supply to Defense Standards UK. Penso que este será uma das áreas importantes a ouvirmos dos próximos oradores, oradores que vêm a seguir a mim. Como referi, as empresas portuguesas que já estejam habituadas a exportar para países terceiros podem beneficiar dessa experiência para uh, fazer negócios com as empresas britânicas e podem até aproveitar para substituir a oferta de algumas empresas de outros países que não estejam tão bem ou tão rapidamente preparadas e que não tenham o tal produto que não seja tão competitivo como o vosso ou como o nosso o produto português. E espera-se que assim se consiga uh, chamar a tal atenção dos decision makers. Nearshoring e a relação histórica. Nearshoring passou a ser de alguns anos, 
desde alguns anos passou a ser particularmente importante e no setor, neste setor também o é. Uh, e para além desta experiência poderão ainda beneficiar da, 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 proximidade, portanto, da proximidade geográfica por um lado, é uma vantagem competitiva quando se compara com alguns países que estão bastante mais distantes, a relação histórica que existe com Portugal, até no Unido de Portugal, não é só bonita nos discursos diplomáticos que se diz, de facto vê-se eh, concretamente no relacionamento comercial que existe entre Portugal e o Reino Unido. As empresas britânicas, se virem, se conseguirmos chamar a atenção delas, se virem uma oportunidade para poderem trabalhar com a empresa portuguesa, fazem. E, de facto, tem-se verificado dos dois lados. Temos visto empresas britânicas que investem em Portugal, em empresas portuguesas, tirando as mais valias de si, e também vemos empresas portuguesas do setor a exportar e a trabalhar com empresas britânicas no mercado do Reino Unido. O ano passado, um documento governamental sobre a estratégia da segurança, defesa e política externa do Reino Unido, inclui Portugal como um dos países europeus cuja parceria é considerada essencial na política internacional pós-breve. Passando rapidamente à legislação específica, um pouco como todos os países, como em todos os países, o negócio da defesa no Reino Unido tem a legislação própria e os agentes económicos que querem comercializar com o Reino Unido terão necessariamente de estar a par da mesma. Uh, título de exemplo, o Reino Unido, apesar da saída da União Europeia, manteve em vigor a diretiva Defense and Security Public Contracts, que regula os processos de, de procurement para o setor da defesa. Valerá, valerá, a pena, valerá a pena estar atento também aos canais informativos do governo britânico, como sendo os do Ministério da Defesa, que contém webinars sobre Doing Business with Defense, Sourcing Portal, entre outros. Bem como os canais portugueses, como sendo o do IDD, do Cluster da AED e o próprio uh, site da ICEP. Para além destas, tenho certamente que os oradores a seguir uh, falarão de outras oportunidades. Para terminar, falo um pouco sobre o que, o que a ICEP faz. A ICEP na área da exportação ajudamos as empresas a dar os seus primeiros passos na internacionalização, ou seja, empresas que ainda não trabalham com o mercado do Reino Unido, que querem abordar o mercado do Reino Unido, podem recorrer a nós para lista de contactos, para tentarmos agendar uh, reuniões B2B quando necessário, reuniões institucionais, a ICEP é a secção comercial da Embaixada de Portugal no Reino Unido, portanto, algum peso institucional poderá ter e podemos ajudar, também ajudamos as empresas que já estão estabelecidas no mercado, que já têm uma empresa importadora ou um parceiro, e aí essas tentamos ajudar a aumentar a cota de mercado. Uma terceira área que trabalhamos é a captação de investimento estruturante para a economia portuguesa. Espero ter dado um pouco a visão do mercado do Reino Unido e, como referi, estou à disposição para responder a perguntas que tenham. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Dr. Pedro Patrício, por uma excelente apresentação, que abordou vários pontos que são muito importantes para uma empresa que queira entrar no mercado britânico, quer, ou queira entrar ou queira aprofundar o seu, a, sua, a sua presença. E agora uh, temos um período de alguns minutos de perguntas e respostas. Quem quiser colocar questões pode ativar o microfone ou pode enviar as questões pelo bate-papo, pelo chat. Um, Pergunto se há alguma questão que queiram, que queiram colocar. Não havendo, não havendo a partir de questões, eu vou colocar uma questão ao Dr. Pedro Patrício, que resulta um pouco da sua apresentação, e que põe-me no lugar de uma pequena e média empresa que tem menos meios para conhecer o mercado, para recolher informação. Uh, uh, o que é que, o que é que, qual é o conselho que a ICEP poderá dar a uma pequena e média empresa que queira entrar no mercado britânico? Não a que já conhece o mercado e que já lá está, mas a que quer entrar de novo. Obviamente o primeiro conselho será contactar a ICEP em Londres, isso não tenho dúvida, mas a, a, a estratégia deverá ser tentar encontrar um parceiro local, tentar instalar-se sozinho no mercado, tentar começar a conhecer o mercado através das exportações, o que é que, da experiência que tem, o que é que acha que, se calhar depende de setor para setor, mas o que é que poderá aconselhar as empresas portuguesas? Somente as PMEs. Muito obrigado pela pergunta. Eu, 
se calhar até antes de contactarem uh, a ICEP em Londres, o principal é a empresa falar com o seu gestor de cliente na ICEP em Portugal, que é Account Manager. Que Account Manager tem como obrigação, é o, é o, é o interlocutor privilegiado entre as empresas e, e, e a ICEP. E o Account Manager poderá ajudar a empresa a orientar se faz mais sentido abordar o mercado britânico, ou espanhol, ou francês, ou angolano, ou outro mercado que seja. Relativamente ao mercado do Reino Unido, uma empresa que queira avançar para o mercado do Reino Unido, uma PME que queira avançar para o Reino Unido, como referi na apresentação, tem que ter algo que acredita que é diferenciador. E o diferenciador pode ser, pode ser custo, pode ser algo inovador, pode ser design, varia muito consoante o setor, mas tem que ter algo que seja catchy, e que a empresa britânica veja uma mais-valia em poder trabalhar, em trabalhar com a empresa portuguesa. Deve a empresa participar logo numa destas feiras com o stand? Eu diria que se calhar tem que avaliar o custo-benefício uh, de uma participação dessas. O acesso à informação não é, não é um entrave. Então, neste setor, a informação existe. Existe nos diversos sites, existe informação social sobre o setor, sobre a evolução, sobre o procurement, sobre que projetos é que existem no Reino Unido. Onde a empresa portuguesa achar que pode ser uma mais-valia, é nesse campo que tem que trabalhar comercialmente. E tem que, tem que ser agressivo comercialmente. Ser agressivo comercialmente não é nada de negativo, antes, pelo contrário, é positivo. Tem que ser agressivo comercialmente e tem que, sobretudo, talvez tentar um B2B, porta a porta, ou por vídeo, tem funcionado bastante nestes tempos de pandemia, onde tenta falar, escolhe quais são as empresas, fala connosco a delegação da ICEP, nós facultamos com base no, naquilo, na indicação que nos é, podemos facultar uma short list de empresas que acreditamos que possam ter interesse e a empresa portuguesa deve contactar essas pessoas diretamente, deve contactar essas empresas diretamente. Quem é que se contacta na empresa? Muitas vezes é difícil, por questões do RGPD dificultam, Consegue-se obter o contacto no LinkedIn, consegue-se saber, podemos ver se há algum português lá que nos possa ajudar a orientar com quem é que se fala e envia-se um, um, um e-mail comercial que seja catchy. E o orador de lá de lá, o potencial orador de lá de lá, ao olhar para o e-mail, veja, eu tenho interesse em saber mais informações, em ter mais informações sobre esta empresa portuguesa, sobre o serviço que esta empresa pode facultar. A ausência de resposta da empresa britânica não quer necessariamente dizer que não estão interessados. Há muitíssimas empresas e todos os dias as empresas são contactadas e claro que, tipo de exemplo como referi, todos querem trabalhar com a False Voice, portanto é somente mais um e-mail. É preciso haver insistências e, e se calhar vale a pena, eu exemplo de False Voice, mas se for uma PME provavelmente não vai trabalhar com uma OEM, vai com trabalhar de um tier 3, 2, 1 e fazer um e-mail tal comercial e referir, eu desloco-me ao mercado do Reino Unido no dia tal, das horas tal, até o dia X, até as horas X, e gostava muito, nesse período de tempo que aí estou, de ir ao vosso escritório falar convosco, de ir apresentar a minha empresa. Isso faz com que, do lado britânico, um, estamos a empurrar para tentar que haja uma resposta, a empresa britânica, ao olhar para o vosso site e o hyperlink, fizeram no vosso e-mail comercial, verá se tem ou não interesse. Se não tiver interesse, provavelmente dirá não, muito obrigado. Mas se tiver interesse, só estamos a pedir 45 minutos do tempo dele, uma hora do tempo deles para que a empresa portuguesa se desloque aos escritórios e aí sim tenha o seu commercial pitch. No commercial pitch, obviamente, que é importante que a empresa esteja bem informada do que se está a passar no mercado britânico, mas também no mercado português e muitas vezes reuniões começam com o um objetivo e se calhar até podem ser, uh, acabar com, com parcerias em mercados terceiros que não se estava à espera, mas o conhecimento dentre de, de as empresas, o B2B, é a melhor forma de o fazer. Tendo um importador, tendo um agente, esse, essa pessoa cá, aí sim poderá indicar vamos participar nesta feira porque faz sentido, porque podemos visibilidade, vamos tentar fazer um consórcio, vamos tentar marcar uma reunião com aquela para entrarmos no, no, no consórcio e aí novamente a ICEP está à disposição se acharem que um e-mail nosso, se acharem que um problema nosso pode fazer a diferença para conseguir abrir a tal porta. Na reunião propriamente dita, 
enfim, são anglo-saxónicos, obviamente para uma reunião em inglês, é sucinta, straight to the point, e em que as, as mais valias estejam, estejam claras. Não sei se respondi totalmente à sua pergunta, mas aconselho claramente a que a empresa ou fale com o seu gestor de cliente, ou se o mercado do Reino Unido é aquele que, que pretende, que fale connosco, e que fale connosco antes de se deslocar ao mercado para tentarmos maximizar a vinda cá ao mercado. Não só para uma reunião, mas tentarmos que tenha várias reuniões. Ok, então, Já agora, obrigado. Ricardo, peço então, desculpa para ver. Sim. Eu creio que temos aqui Miguel Braga, que deseja colocar sim, um sim, 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 eu vi. Obrigado, okay. João. Eu, eu, eu vou dar mais tempo para mais uma pergunta, apesar de já estarmos um bocadinho atrasados, mas não há, não há problema. O doutor Miguel Braga, se faz favor, da ceia, quer colocar também uma questão. Não sei se consegue ativar o microfone ou não, senão eu, já está ativado. Já está, ok. Creio que estamos a ouvir, certo? Certo, certo. Sim. Bom, cumprimentar o Ricardo e cumprimentando o Ricardo e dizer agradecer a oportunidade de, deste webinar um, e também, obviamente, uh, cumprimentar o Pedro Patrício, que tive a oportunidade já de conhecer noutras funções uh, que teve e, portanto, uh, sei que tem muita experiência um, na ICEP e na, na ajuda às empresas do, no seu posicionamento comercial. Uh, o, o CEIA tem, de facto, um caminho já feito, ou seja, nós somos uh, Tier 1 da Leonardo Helicópteros, também no Reino Unido, em Yeovil, onde já tivemos, onde temos engenheiros, onde estamos com frequência, obviamente nos últimos meses uh, menos presentes por temas da pandemia, uh, e é definitivamente um mercado onde nós queremos crescer, não só com a própria Leonardo Helicópteros, que, enfim, com a informação que vamos podendo ter, uh, sabemos que o Reino Unido investirá uh, fortemente, como o Pedro Patrício também disse, na área da defesa e, portanto, sempre que a Leonardo Helicópteros no Reino Unido cresce, potencialmente aumentamos a nossa capacidade de ter mais negócio, porque ativam a supply chain e, portanto, é aí que queremos, que queremos continuar a estar. O que, de facto, foi um bocadinho novo aqui nesta apresentação e foi o que mais me fixou, foi esta questão do nearshoring. Ou seja, Portugal tem de facto muita experiência como país na criação de centros de competências com os OEMs e com os tiruanos. Eu trabalhei quase 10 anos numa multinacional chamada Altran, que tem de facto muito sucesso nesta questão do Nearshoring e, portanto, era algo que eu gostava de explorar e, portanto, a minha pergunta para o Pedro Patrício era se podíamos depois, num momento que a sua agenda permitisse, falarmos um bocadinho e se calhar tentar ajudar-nos, se possível, a identificar quem podem ser ao nível de tier 1, porque no Reino Unido os tier 1 são muito grandes e, portanto, são quase OEMs do ponto de vista do potencial negócio que podemos fazer com eles, e identificar, porque nós temos as competências em Portugal, temos a capacidade de ser, para ser competitivos, muitas vezes nos custos de desenvolvimento, temos capacidade de experiência, e o SEIA está muito disponível até pela sua configuração de centro de engenharia e desenvolvimento de produto, que tem uma grande diferença para as empresas, é que no final não remunera os seus acionistas, mas reinveste aquilo que é capaz de gerar em cada ano económico, e acho que inclusivamente esta, esta característica do SEIA pode ser interessante ser apresentada a quem connosco e em Portugal esteja disponível para, fazer este, para criar estes centros de competências. E, portanto, era um bocadinho este mais, pergunta, mais pedido do que pergunta podermos analisar essa possibilidade. E, obviamente, para nós fazemos, como creio que todos os colegas de outras empresas que aqui estão fazem igual, um assessment ao mercado, mas às vezes é difícil perceber sozinhos o tamanho, a capacidade aquilo que é o make or buy dessas, dessas, desses possíveis clientes, porque é muito relevante para nós perceber o make or buy, porque todas as empresas que fazem muita subcontratação porque estrategicamente optam por essa via, então é onde nós temos que ir mais, porque se fazem subcontratação também podem subcontratar a Portugal e é aí que nós queremos estar. E, portanto, mais do que agradecendo a oportunidade, mais do que uma pergunta era se calhar podemos trocar contactos e falar um bocadinho com a sua presença e experiência e conhecimento desse mercado. Esta questão da Nier Shonen chamou-me particularmente a atenção. Obrigado, obrigado Miguel Braga. Nós já estamos um bocadinho atrasados, eu ia só pedir 
com certeza que isto é uma ótima ocasião para trocar contactos e é só pedir ao Pedro Patrício na resposta para não ser muito, para não se alongar muito, peço desculpa, mas é só por causa de uma questão do horário. Está a apelar ao meu poder de síntese. Exato. Passo por pontos. Caro Miguel Braga, é um prazer vê-lo novamente. Falou na Altran. A Altran é um excelente exemplo de como trabalhar em Portugal conseguindo retirar o melhor que Portugal tem para oferecer, um caso de sucesso. A CEIA, nós trabalhamos com o que eu sei de uma forma próxima, na área do, em várias áreas, com, com muito abrangentes, não só nesta, nesta, nesta área que aqui, aqui nos traz. A minha disponibilidade para falar consigo sobre, então, sobre, a minha disponibilidade para falar consigo é sempre total. Para falar consigo sobre uma abordagem ao nearshoring do CEIA, era algo que eu fizemos com todo o gosto. É algo que é difícil de fazer, é algo que faz todo o sentido de ser feito e é um processo demorado em que devemos mapear quem são os potenciais targets e começarmos a ir bater à porta desses e ver o que, como é que vos conseguimos posicionar. Portanto, naturalmente, após uh, este evento, falaremos com todo o gosto e, e vemos o, tentamos fazer um, um cronograma e tentamos atingir, pôr umas metas que gostaríamos de atingir. Não me alongo mais porque senão dizem que falo muito. <risos> muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, obrigado, obrigado pela minha parte. Uh, vamos, vamos conseguir, vou passar para inglês. So, um, let's now proceed with the, with the second speaker. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, the second speaker is Dominic Guinness uh, for, the, for the UK Defense and Security Exports. So he's a Defense and Security Specialist Uh, and uh, we'll, he will introduce us about the, the, the UK market. I, I noticed that in the chat we, are, we have a question for Brindley Salzman. Uh, we'll, we'll get there after the, after the, 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 the presentation of, uh, of Dominic. Dominic, please, the floor is yours. Ricardo, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's see if I can get the technology to work. I managed to do it beforehand, so hopefully we can do it again. Just could just someone tell me that they can see the slides? Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Ricardo, thank you very much indeed, and thank you everybody as well. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be have the opportunity to um, talk to you this morning. Um, as I said, my name is uh, Dominic Guinness. I am the Defence and Security Inward Investment Lead in the UK's Department for International Trade here in London. Um, just a quick word on Uh, the department itself, it's responsible for all the trade negotiations and also supporting exporters from the UK and supporting overseas companies to invest in the UK. Also for the likes of export licensing and also uh, it has under its control organization UK Export Finance, uh, which as the name suggests is about supporting uh, exporters with uh, financial support. Um, Within the department here, we have, uh, due to the special impact that national security has, we have a specialist team um, uh, which focuses on the needs of the defence and security sector. Uh, that's the UK DSE, UK Defence and Security Exports. Um, and it's primarily, whilst it's primarily concerned with supporting exports, uh, we also do support inward investment, and that is the, the, the focus of my role and my, and my presentation to you today. What I want to do is give you um, take a few minutes talking about the UK defence sector uh, and the opportunities that are, with, are here, here within it. Um, to, uh, apologies, I, I'm, I'm starting from a, 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 a base of I'm not sure exactly what the people's understanding of it, so I'm afraid I'm going to throw some numbers at you to, to begin with um, in terms of the size of the sector here in the UK. Um, we are the fourth largest, um, have the fourth largest defence budget globally. Uh, it's the largest in Europe, uh, spending 2.3% of our GDP on defence. Uh, as a consequence, uh, maybe you might say there is a thriving uh, defence industrial sector in the UK, which uh, Brindley mentioned earlier in his presentation and some of the statistics um, in terms of the size and scale uh, of the turnover, etc., what is going on here. Uh, we have also the key domestic primes like uh, BAE Systems, um, but also a significant presence from the major overseas companies, uh, the likes of Lockheed Martin, Thales, uh, Raytheon and Leonardo. Uh, 
The UK MOD spends about £19.5 billion pounds a year on equipment and support, uh, and in particular has a, uh, a, 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 a focus on supporting small and medium enterprises, um, uh, with which it already spends over a, over a billion pounds each year and has ambitions to increase that expenditure. I uh, mentioned that uh, in, in terms of uh, the supply chain, in terms of how, it, how it's looking to grow that. Uh, worth also noting that the on the increase in its expenditure on research development, which I will cover a little bit later um, with regards to the new industrial strategy that was launched earlier on, on this year. Uh, that's um, what Brindley mentioned a, a figure of the total spend, but this is actually the departmental spend, the government spend on defence and security research and development. Uh, and that's that expenditure is not just internally, but it's also out with industry and, and with academia. To, Dived out a little more detail uh, in terms of where that money is going to be spent. Um, just worth noting, just in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the amount of money that is going to be spent, we're targeting to spend about 190 billion in the next 10 years. Uh, the largest of which is going to be going on the uh, uh, some of the uh, some major programs here, the likes of the submarine program, which is the uh, recapitalization and rebuild of the, the UK's nuclear deterrent submarine capability. Uh, but it also includes the likes of the Tempest Future Combat Aircraft Program um, and within the other services, uh, the new is about to be launch a competition for a new helicopter variant, uh, the medium lift helicopter, uh, a new satellite communication system to replace um, Skynet 5, or Skynet 6 as it's called, uh, and for the Navy uh, and the Army, the likes of the new support ships uh, and also the uh, new land equipments, the upgrade to the uh, Challenger tanked to Challenger 3, the Ajax program, and also the purchase of the Boxer 8x8 uh, armor personnel carrier. It, as well as these huge, I would say these huge programs, these large multi-billion pound, pound programs, uh, which as you will see are going very much on the, which we say the traditional uh, types of, uh, of um, traditional areas of, uh, of capability. Um, there is also a considerable amount being spent on, on research and development. Um, and nothing else to make sure we have the future uh, sorted as well in terms of where the future technologies are going. Areas like autonomy are, are becoming more and more mainstream, uh, building on the UK's expertise in this area. For example, the Navy, Royal Navy, has just invested in a new unmanned mine countermeasure system, which has been developed by TALIS and L3 Harris here in the UK. Uh, also, we in the Air Force, we have the Project Mosquito, as it's called, which is for a loyal wingman technology to support the RAF and the new Tempest program. Uh, within the Army, uh, they have been conducting a series of what they're calling the Army warfighting experiments each year, focusing on how they're going to use the use new technologies. Uh, in 2021, for example, uh, the focus there was on collective training and how to use the greater um, synthetic training aids uh, to deliver that. Previously, it was on, on command control the year before that. Uh, I mentioned these because the uh, industry is was closely involved in that, that the Army Warfight Experiments was a six-week uh, 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 process, um, a, a selection process to down-select the, the, who the technologies were. And most of these companies were small, medium enterprises. They were not the larger primes. They were the, they were the, the SMEs, uh, as the MOD realizes that that is where the true innovation happens. So we're uh, always interested in understanding what the opportunities might be in innovation. Uh, within the MOD, they even have a the, the DASA, the Defense and Security Accelerator, which is uh, focused on uh, working with SMEs, uh, issuing it issues challenges out um, to the marketplace, where uh, and, and is able to fund. Uh, and it's, we're talking small amounts of money being being used to help seed fund ideas and help companies develop that. Uh, the DASA is part of uh, DSTL, Defence and Science Technology Laboratory. Um, worth mentioning at this stage, the um, uh, the Defence and Security Industrial Strategy, the, the, the DSIS, uh, which you may have heard of, heard about, uh, was published in March last year. Um, one of the uh, key tenants of, of it, the key thrusts of it, is it recognises that the defence and security industry is in itself a strategic capability. Um, it's uh, with the uh, UK has always had, previously had a much more open approach to its uh, its, its procurement, and was um, 
uh, as a consequence, we were finding ourselves with um, issues uh, within the UK of a lack of capability. We were literally hollowing out our defense, our defense industry because we were buying too much from overseas. Um, that to the defense and security industrial strategy is important because of that, that clear recognition and the recognition that the Ministry of Defense has a role to play in securing the UK's prosperity and securing the UK's national security by ensuring that we have a robust um, defense industrial capability that's able to deliver the needs of the government. Um, the, the, you see on the screen here the, the key thrusts for the, uh, for, for the, for the strategy it's about um, the um, uh, improving how we how the mod procures and making sure that we, they are able to give greater visibility to industry um, and greater there's greater transparency in terms of of how the programs are, are, are going to be developed that the reason for that is it enables industry to actually invest and know what what is coming up and therefore they are able to invest appropriately um, the fo greater focus on the supply chain, a greater focus on resilience to that supply chain, uh, understanding that um, it's not just about the primes, it is all about the smaller companies who are supplying them. Where are where is that technology coming from, and how are they on uh, 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 the health of that supply chain? Um, issues like skills, and also ensuring that we are do not suffer from uh, foreign. Uh, toxic uh, investment, should we say, from as more unfriendly countries, which uh, is, there is a danger, uh, as I'm sure everyone appreciates, the lower down the supply chain you, you go. Um, also, the importance of technology, the increase of research development in order to have those capabilities, the MOD realise it has to help government, help industry invest. So there's an announcement of £6.6 .6 billion pounds of additional money for research development. A substantial tranche of that is going on the Tempest uh, Future Combat Aircraft uh, um, program, but there is that is only, that is only only two billion of, of the six. Um, so there is, um, there is there is scope, and there's additional investment going into other areas. Um, and I think from from a, a Department of International Trade perspective, um, this last bullet, uh, and we have a, which where we have a key key part to play in supporting it. It's a realization that. Um, uh, and recognition of the fact that the UK cannot do everything. Uh, we are interested and in much greater efforts have been made in, on international collaboration, ensuring that the UK is able to play to its strengths, um, it, uh, uh, involved in, in those programs, in making sure it's putting the right technologies into those programs, and it has the capability to be a key player in those programs. Um, the, how important it is to support exports. Uh, the UK is not a big enough market for a capability in its own right, uh, it needs to ensure that we can uh, export uh, that capability around the world to give industry the larger market that it took to play in. Therefore, my role, uh, sorry, my department's role in UK defence and security exports is ha has been uh, enhanced and, and strengthened in our ability to do that. Uh, we have a, a network of, uh, of, of companies Of, of locations around the world in all our embassies, high commissions are able to support um, companies working to export. Uh, I'm sorry, Dominic. Um, yeah, having a problem. All you, with all we sound. Are. Okay, so if you are a U UK, okay. yes. Yeah, the, 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 when you are talking, sometimes the, your sound disappears. I think okay. We're having a problem with with the connection. Um, okay, I will. I'll. Start. So let's Let see me, if it is so. Yeah, does that is that, is that better? Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Is that better? No. Uh, it's the, it go, joy, it the joys of goes. being back in the office. I have better internet. Connectivity at my at home. Oh right, <laughs> okay. Than I do in. Uh, um, let me know. Is that is that better? Yeah, there is. There are there are interruptions. Joys of non technology. <laughs> okay. Ricardo, maybe if we switch off, okay. the camera um, is better. 
Yeah. Maybe maybe if you if you close the camera, switch off the camera, maybe because you will have more space for the for the sound to pass through. Uh, yeah, you can still see the slides, that's the important thing. Yes, we can see the slides. <coughs> Okay. No problem with the slides. You still have the slides? Yes. Is, is, okay. The yeah. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me, I will try to continue um, and let, hopefully that will, um, uh, we will, we will make some progress. Uh, my apologies for that. That's joys of modern technology. Um, the, so yes, so the support for, for exports, um, a key part of that industrial strategy and a key part is a collaboration and exports in terms of the recognition of how important that is to uh, sort of support it. And again, it, industry cannot survive on just what the UK Ministry of Defence is doing. It needs to have a, a have a larger market and therefore government needs to support those support those exports. And it's also about attracting and supporting um, foreign companies who want to come and invest in the UK and bring their ideas and uh, it, to the UK and supporting the 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 the, the, the uh, so to strengthen the, the, the UK's defence and security sector. Um, and to give you just some examples of here, here are, I hope that you see the, the photographs here of all some of the pictures of all some of the major programmes that the Ministry of Defence are, uh, are, are going through at the moment. I put them up here because they are all to a greater or larger extent uh, and have a strong involvement from overseas companies. Uh, the, they are the, of the large global, a lot of the large global primes. Um, so the likes of Rheinmetall and Lockheed Martin, even our aircraft carrier regard has a, um, a, a, a has a, has a, a input from the likes of Thales, from L3 Harris, uh, and the uh, in terms of the of the equipment and supply and and components of that. Um, the Challenger 3, the upgrade of the tank is being undertaken by Rheinmetall, and even if we look at the UK's nuclear deterrent. That is uh, at, at heart. Uh, Lockheed Martin are part of the uh, are, are the, one of the key primes in terms of the delivery of that. So the point I want to make here is that um, the UK is um, not, uh, uh, despite even the the, the industrial strategy um, being perceived as being a by British policy, uh, it, it is absolutely not. And uh, we uh, the MOD are. are are very firm the fact that they, if, if the technology is right, they will uh, will continue to buy from uh, overseas companies. They will they will want that uh, those overseas companies to think about growing their uh, presence in the UK uh, to help deliver that if for if the national sovereign requirements are there. But they will uh, they will uh, are not wedded to the idea that it has to be uh, has to be in the UK or for, for everything. Um, Brindley covered some of this in terms of the events, but I just want to share some of you the other opportunities to market um, your products and services to the, to the, to the within the UK. Um, he mentioned the uh, uh, Defence and Security Equipment International, DSEI, which is next year now. Um, Julia is about to follow up after me about talk about the Farmer International Air Show. Um, there's also the DVD, Defence Vehicle Dynamics Show here in London. Uh, and also the likes of the Royal International Air to uh, A very useful show for smaller companies is DPRTE, Defence Procurement Research Technology Exportability, which is in May this year. That is run by the UK's Defence uh, and, and Equipment Support Agency, DENS, uh, also at Farnborough, and a good opportunity for smaller, smaller companies to uh, show their wares. Um, in terms of, I don't know, given the time, I'm going to flick on uh, yes, skip a couple of slides here. Um, I think in terms of, so you know, I've talked to you about coming to the UK and the market opportunity. Um, what is the support that I can provide from here from the Department of National Trade? Uh, we are very much here to support a company's investment in the UK, to support their, their move into the UK. We recognise the issues and and uh, challenges that companies have moving into a new market, and we are very much here to help advise and support the free service um, to help companies understand the, 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 the best and, and swiftest way of establishing themselves in the, in the new market. Um, and that covers a whole range, as you see on screen, a whole range of, of, of assistance, be it visas, uh, be it um, helping you understand where is the best part of the UK to, to locate yourself. 
Um, I'm going to pause there um, to see if there are any questions. I hope the sound uh, held up the last bit of the, of, of, of the, sh of the uh, presentation. Um, there are my contact details, and I'd be delighted to, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, send them to me directly by email. But I will otherwise, if, if we have time, which we may not, I'm delighted to answer some now. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. Your sound was, was okay in the, in the end. Um, I, I'm going to ask all the presenters if they can share the slides with us. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions that you would like to to make to any of the presenters afterwards, please send it to me, and I can forward to to them. Um, we have now a five minute period for questions before I pass the floor to to Julie Mears. Uh, I don't know if anyone can ask uh, wants to ask a question. Uh, otherwise, I will ask myself one to to Dominic. Um, so if 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 uh, if there is no no questions, Dominic, my question will be from the, again from the perspective of a small business sized firm in Portugal. Uh, usually in the in the defense market, there are some types of restrictions that uh, all countries put uh, in their in their own markets, and this is related with the kind of security clearance that is required to operate in the in the in any market. And I think the, the UK is not uh, an exception to that. Uh, so I, I wonder if uh, you can uh, tell us, uh, and I hope that this question is not too specific, if there there were any changes after Brexit on these, uh, or or if the usual uh, procedures for uh, uh, a company from abroad to operate in the UK market are still the same. So if there is any need to go to the to MOD and ask for uh, for a clearance. As it happens in uh, in other countries, can you um, say something on this? There are no specific changes that have come in since the the, the, the UK left the EU. Um, there are there remain these the same security requirements um, that we've we, we've had had before, um, and it depends on upon actually the security classification of the program that is that is uh, being being delivered. Uh, there remains the what the, in the UK we call the list X requirements, but that is something that the English defence will ask a company to provide, and there are clear uh, requirements in terms of how they uh, what the requirements are for that for that uh, in terms of the requirement for UK nationals, for example, to be part of that. That is only for the highest security classifications. Otherwise, the, the rules are, are unchanged. Okay, thank you very much. So if if you if you do not have any further questions and I don't see any, uh, we'll proceed with uh, with uh, with Julie Mears, and that will talk us about the Fardo International Air Show, and I will explain in the end uh, that is also an important uh, let's say milestone or event where the Portuguese uh, firms and the UK firms can can meet. Julie, please, the floor your is yours. We are not hearing you. I, don't I know think you... Julie is okay. muted. So I will. You are, you are now, your, your micro now. is turned off. Hello, Julie. Is there any? Can you can we help you? We can't hear you, Julie. Uh, I noticed you're not muted anymore, but we still can't hear you. We're the microphone is now is on, but uh... can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Ah, <laughs> I apologize. I am going to start sharing my slides. I am not sure what happened there. Hopefully, you can see them. Are you yes, able? you can see them. Yeah. Um, uh, please excuse me. I am not going to go on um, camera mainly for bandwidth reasons, but also yes. I am obviously having 
technical problems this morning because my camera is not working either. So I apologize for that. So uh, let me start, introduce myself. I'm Julie Mears. I'm the Assistant Director of Delegations and Protocol at Farnborough International, um, working very closely with ADS and UK DSE. Um, so what am I going to cover? Just a, bit, a little bit about who we are in case you're, you're not aware of us, uh, what we do as a, as a company of Farnborough International, um, and then I'm going to cover the air show and how the air show can help um, IDD uh, Portugal Defence and um, the, uh, the companies involved in that. So, who are we? Uh, Farnborough International, we actually started as, a, as an air show in 1948. Um, we were actually a government run air show at that point, um, but then became commercial. And um, we, we have changed our uh, remit over the last couple of years. And we now um, like to see ourselves as a global platform for connecting people. Um, I think there is an element that people think air shows and trade shows are very transactional, and we are trying to move away from that. We are trying to support all our companies that come in and um, be work very closely with you um, 365 days a year, if possible. And how do we do that? So, um, as you can see, the aircraft in the middle depicts the Farnborough International Air Show. That is core to our being. That is who we are. But we are also aware that industry, government, uh, external, the external community need more than just the air shows to connect. And um, from looking back and, and looking through how we can do this, how we've changed over the last two years and moved to digital, we now have the opportunity to ena enable industry governments to connect more than just at the air show, which is obviously um, our, our uh, remit for being, but we like to think we can, we can connect more so. One of the opportunities um, is through FIN, which is our Farnborough International News Network. This allows um, companies to work with our team, do digital video, announce inf information. Um, so we, we, we are trying very much to be more encompassing. And obviously one of the things that we work very closely to do is with our ADS partners and obviously myself and Brinley um, do this sort of uh, presentation on both sides fairly often and it's it's really good to show um, the external community that ADS and the FIL work closely together and on the outside you can see some very key um, global events that happen that we would like to see keep the opportunities we provide keeping that dialogue going so what are the themes that Farnborough International puts across all its um, events and very much so through Farnborough International? I don't think these pillars are going to come as a surprise to anyone listening to this presentation. Space, sustainability, future flight, which is civil and military, and also the future workforce, which is so important with all the changes that this um, global um, look at sustainability and how we, we work to, to change how we do things is going to be so important. And underpinning all of these four themes are the aerospace defence and innovation that we try and pull together at our events, and very much so at Farnborough. So just a little bit of background to show you why Farnborough is significant. So in 2018, um, we had 1,500 exhibitors from 48 countries. Um, a lot of those exhibitors bring aircraft, but we also have aircraft um, brought in from governments around the world, um, the UK, UK RAF, the DOD from the US. Um, so that for us is just a showcase of, of what the industry provides to not only our air forces, but, but to our airlines as well. Um, in 2018, 
in deals and this um, I do need to add is just in the aerospace world this does not include defense um, deals 192 billion dollars worth of business was done at Farnborough International so as you can see it's it's not an insignificant um, number of people coming together um, we had 1800 media from across the world um, and I think the significance here is that we had 80,000 visitors, 55% from the UK, which you would sort of anticipate, but 45% international just shows how international we really are. And 82% 82 of the top 100 companies actually exhibit. What is important to Farnborough is the supply chain. Yes, we have the primes, we have the OMEs. But we're really key to ensuring those SMEs that attend and exhibit get connected with those primes, but also with the delegates that I manage. So um, in 2018, we had 156 senior military and civil government delegations. And those delegates are managed through myself and my team, through UK DSE and through ADS. We work really care closely with the companies that are exhibiting to see how we can help make those connections. And, um, you know, there are a few major trade shows that bring the global supply chain together like Farnborough does. And I think this, after the last two years we've had, is going to be really strategic in providing help to the recovery and contribution to the industry. <clears throat> So how how can IDD Portugal Defence get involved with Farnborough and what will it bring to them? Connections, future workforce, engagement with industry and government, and of course the flying display. And and how can we do that? So this is a fairly basic slide of how IDD Portugal can get involved and how Farnborough International can help them tell their story. So, you know, yes, there's the there's whole space, the exhibiting opportunities. That could be from an individual company, or it could be a Portuguese pavilion. There are branding opportunities, sponsorship opportunities. Um, there are chalet opportunities where, you know, uh, IDD Portugal could perhaps have a chalet um, at host at lunch times, etc. There are networking opportunities, which obviously the delegations program falls under, but we've got a, a new program called the Business Connections Exchange. This was formerly our Meet the Buyer program. This is where key procurement officers from companies come in and suppliers can sign up to meet with those buyers. <clears throat> and we are now opening it also up to suppliers to meet with suppliers because we've been told by the SME and supply chain community that they don't always know suppliers out there that can help them with expanding their product. So that is an, a new opportunity that we are providing this year. And then obviously the recruitment, the workforce. Barbara Friday has now been uh, changed to the pioneers of tomorrow, and we're really encouraging industry and um, the governments that are attending the F, the Royal Air Force, the DOD, to really participate in this and show the um, under 16s and those that are looking to reskill how um, the the this industry is so important to them, and um, you know we really want to encourage it. This is my final slide, and I think it just shows you the expanse of everything that happens at the air show. I just want to draw your attention to two areas that are new this time. That is the space zone and the aerospace global forum. More information on the global forum will be uh, issued by Farnborough International in the next two weeks. And I will make sure Ricardo gets that information for you. The space zone during the pandemic, we had to look at how we um, changed things and we brought a film studio company on site and they have built two film studios 
they are handing them back to us for the air show, which is hugely exciting. So we will now have an immersive space zone and a global forum that can be that are soundproofed. So there will be things happening all day long within those areas. But I think just this map just shows you the expanse of what the air show can offer to IDD Portugal. And on that note, I'd like to say obrigado and thank you for your attention. Um, you can see my email here, but what I will do is rather than share these slides, Ricardo, I'm going to slide, uh, share a pack of information that just covers a little bit more, but also gives more contact points um, and that you are quite at liberty to share with everyone listening on, on this webinar. Okay. Thank you very much, Julie. Um... For your presentation and for the for the information that we are going to send us, you know that the uh, IDD Portugal Defence, together with the Defence Cluster IAD, we are going to have a, a stand, a booth in in, uh, in Farnborough, and all the Portuguese farms are of course invited to to go there and, uh, and to use the facilities or the stand that that we are going to to have at Farnborough. Um, so let just just to finish, and because we are already late, uh, fifteen minutes. Uh, let me start by thanking all the presenters and also by thanking the British Embassy in Lisbon and Sofia Carvalhage because uh, I, I forgot in the beginning. I'm sorry for that. It was my fault uh, because she, she helped us also setting up this, this webinar. So thank you very much. Um, the, the, main, the main goal of this webinar was first, of course, everybody knows that the British market is very important. It, uh, it sells uh, an early amount volume of uh, around 100, 100 million billion euros uh, in the uh, of defense products and services so it's a very huge market where there is a lot of opportunities for the portuguese firms uh, the largest and also the the small and medium sized uh, businesses uh, and the idea was not only to give a presentation of the british market but also to introduce the industry day that is uh, that will take place in May, in the first or in the second week of May. The, the final date is not yet settled, but we'll give you more information very soon about it. So this industry day will be organized by IDD Portugal Defense and also by ADS, which is our, our partner in UK, and also with, with, with the support of uh, ISEP and, uh, and, uh, and UK DSC and also IAD. So uh, w w with the idea of of putting the Portuguese firms and UK firms uh, more closer and talking with each other, and to, to in order to have opportunities to do in business and to and to and to cooperate in uh, in areas such as R and D or cyber defense or 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 other or space or other areas where the both both companies of the of the two countries have, have interests. Uh, and after May, we'll also be as I mentioned. Uh, in Farnborough in July, and that there will be a second opportunity for the Portuguese firms that go to London to meet uh, the British counterparts. So, thank you, thank you very much to you all. I hope it was fruitful to those that attended, and uh, please be, feel free to contact me if you have any 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 further question. We will we'll, uh, give uh, the slides that were the presentations will be available at uh, IDD website uh, uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Muito obrigado e bom dia. Vou proceder ao encerramento da sessão.